Well, hello everyone and welcome to another video teaching going along with our Fear Free Year Bible Study. This is the Bible study where we're taking a look at all the different verses in the Bible which are instructive to us on how to live without fear and worry and anxiety in our present day and age. And you might notice behind me, I've got some stacked up outdoor furniture, which is indicative of what's going on in my present day and age. Um, we just got the fearful news that a hurricane was gonna come our way. I'm here in Florida. And this is some of what you gotta do to prepare for a hurricane when you get this frightening news that one might be might be hitting. And it got me to thinking, oh, and by the way, don't worry, it's past. That was yesterday, but um, this is what I gotta clean up today. <laughs> anyway, it got me thinking about if there was any um, stories in the Bible which gave us an indication what people did in their day and age to prepare when they got some fearful news. And it drove me to a fear-free verse in one of the most known stories in the entire Bible. So if you're somebody who doesn't read the Bible, but um, you have some inkling of what's going on in there, this is gonna be a teaching for you. And if you are somebody who is a lifelong Bible student, well, I'm hoping to give you some extra important details that surround this very, very familiar verse in the Bible. It's in chapter two of the book of Luke, and it is surrounding the announcement of the birth of Jesus Christ. And we are gonna see our Fear Free verse uh, in, in the story, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about all the circumstances that surround it. So we're gonna start in the book of Luke, chapter two, and it's verse eight, and I'll read, and let's see where our Fear Free verse falls. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear. Here's our fear-free verse, verse 10. And an angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly... Was, um, there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angel went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made, made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And it goes on. So can't you just see Linus saying that verse on the stage in, in, the, in the Christmas cartoon that we've all come to know and love? Very, very familiar story. And there sits a fear-free verse. And it's the angel of the Lord telling the shepherds in the field not to fear. Something very common in the Bible, when an angel shows up, people are frightened. So just wipe out of your mind any image of a cuddly little, you know, fat baby with wings as an angel. That is not what angels look like when they appear to humankind. They are frightening and people very often hit the deck, fall on their faces and are terrified. So very often, again, in the Bible, you'll see after an angel appears or says something, the angel says, fear not. And this is exactly what happened to the shepherds. And as you go along in that story, you see that another thing that happens is the glory of the Lord shone all around them. And that too was a frightening thing, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. And then we have a, a heavenly host of angels um, singing, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among men with those whom he is pleased. So a whole bunch of fearful things and a whole bunch of magnificent miracle things going on. And what you see at the end of the story is the reaction that the shepherds have to this news, this frightening spectacle, is they go in haste to Bethlehem. So no preparation, they just pick up and go. At least none that we see in the Bible, no preparation. Not like us here in Florida, we're getting water, we're filling our cars with, with gas. They just go with haste, they quickly go, which makes me think um, that's part of the reason that God decided to announce this news, firstly, 
to shepherds in a field that he knew that they would go in haste. Did you, did you ever think about that? Why did God pick them? Why didn't he pick leaders of the community or leaders of the temple? No, he went to shepherds in a field. And I think part of the reason is that he knew that they would go in haste. And that means they went quickly. They just went to go see this miracle that the Savior, the Messiah, was born. So why did they why did they do that? Why did they go with haste? Well, number one, you see in the song that the that the angels sing, they say that um, peace is going to come among those whom God is pleased. Well, there's nothing probably more in the world than shepherds wanted was than peace. Um, if you didn't know it, being a shepherd in that day and age was, was nothing to be revered. It was a very, very lowly position and a position that was mocked and a, and a position that was derided. So these shepherds, they, they heard those words, the singing of the angels, and, and I am quite sure that they wanted peace. They wanted peace in their life. They wanted to have a peaceful life where they weren't tormented. And so I think that's one of the reasons they went in haste. They just said, oh, we want God to give us peace. Um, and so off they went. The other reason I believe that God um, spoke to these angels and they went in ha uh, to the shepherds and they went in haste is that the shepherds, they were tough people. They, they were not people who were, who were just, um, you know, weak spined and, and, you know, cuddling the sheep. Yes, they loved the sheep, but they also had to protect these sheep with their very lives. It was their livelihood. And so shepherds were tough, tough as nails. You see David in, in the Old Testament talking about how he killed a bear, and I think he even said a lion with, you know, on his watch. So shepherds came across some terrifying situations, and they had to be very tough. They had to fight off predators and they had to sleep in the elements to protect their sheep. So these shepherds going in haste, they 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 didn't have, they didn't say, "Oh, what do we got to do?" and we should do this and they didn't worry. They were strong, tough as nails. They went to brave the the trek and see the Messiah who had been born because they were tough. So I think that's another reason why God chose the shepherds. <clears throat> another reason I alluded to earlier is they were lowly lowly position, humble. They were already in a position where they had nothing to lose. They were just kind of the, the least of the least forgotten as far as a employment status. And um, often you'll see in the Bible that this is whom God will choose, the humble, the lowly. He resists the proud. He resists those who are in high positions. And he goes to the humble and the lowly. And so he went to these shepherds, and the other part of that is the, the, they had nothing to lose at all. And I believe that God knew that when they went and they saw exactly what he said they were going to see, they would have no fear themselves of telling other people because they were already mocked and derided and scorned and, and the least of, of all the peoples uh, in, in you know their job group. And so they didn't care if people were making fun of them. They were already lowly, humble. So these are some of the reasons why I think that God chose to go to the shepherds and, and off they went. Now, let's go back to this glory of the Lord that shone all around the shepherds and how that is a frightening thing. You, you might think, oh, magnificent, gorgeous, amazing. No, the, the glory of the Lord, when we see it in the Old Testament, is a frightening thing to see. And I'm specifically talking about in the book of Ezekiel, <clears throat> where we see the vision that God gave Ezekiel of the glory of the Lord. And it is not a pretty... Thing. It is nothing that you want to show up in your world. So in the book of Ezekiel, we'll go to uh, chapter 1 of Ezekiel, and you're going to see the description of the glory of the Lord. And I'm going to read it because it's, it is pretty crazy. This is what, this is what Ezekiel saw uh, and is described as the glory of the Lord. Verse 4 of Ezekiel chapter 1. As I looked, behold, a stormy wind came out of the north, and a great cloud with brightness around it, and a flash, and a fire flashing forth continually, and in the midst of the fire, as it were gleaming metal. 
And from the midst of it came a likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had a human likeness, but they had four faces, and each of them had four wings. Their legs were straight, the soles of their feet were like the soles of a calf's foot, and under it sparkled br uh, like br burnished bronze. Under their wings and on their four sides they had human hands, and on the four... Uh, their faces and their wings thus. Their wings touched one another, each of them, one, one went straight forward without turning, and it went. As for the likeness of their faces, each had a human face. The four had a face of a lion on the right side, the four had a face of an ox on the left side, the four had a face of an eagle, that were their faces, and their, oh, I skipped a face, oh, and a human face, sorry. Um, such were their faces, and their wings were spread out above. Each creature had two wings, each of which touched the wing of the other, while two covered their bodies. And each went straight forward. Wherever the spirit would go, they went, without turning, as they went. And as the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, like the appearance of torches moving to and fro among the living creatures. And the fire was bright. And out of the fire went forth lightning, and the living creatures darted to and fro like the appearance of the flash of lightning. Now I looked, and as the living creatures, I saw a wheel on the earth beside the living creatures, one for each of the four of them. As for their appearance of the wheels, their construction and their appearance was like gleaming barrel, and the four had the same likeness, their appearance and construction being, as it were, a wheel within a wheel. When they went, they went in any of the four directions. Without turning, they went, and their rims were tall and awesome, and the rims of all four were full of eyes all around. And when the living creatures went, the wheels went beside them. And when the living creatures rose from the earth, the wheels rose. Wherever the spirit wanted to go, they went, and the wheels rose along with them, for the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. When those went, they went, and when those stood, those stood, and when those rose from the earth on the wheels rose along with them, for the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. Over the heads of the living creatures there was the likeness of an expanse, shining like awe-inspiring crystal spread out above their heads. And under the expanse, their wings were stretched out straight one towards another. And each creature had two wings covering its body. And when they went, I heard the sound of their wings, the sound like many waters, like the sound of the Almighty, a sound of a tumult, the sound of an army. When they stood still, they let down their wings, and, they came, and, and there came a voice from above the expanse over the heads. When they stood still, they let down their wings. And above the expanse, over their heads, was the likeness of a throne in the appearance like sapphire. And seated above the likeness of the throne was the likeness of a human appearance. And upward from what I had, what had the appearance of his waist, I saw on it gleaming metal, like the appearance of fire, a closed all around. And downward from what had the appearance of his waist, I saw there the appearance of fire. And there was the brightness around him, like the appearance of the bow that was in the cloud on the day of the rain. So was the appearance of the brightness all around. Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell on my face and heard the voice of one speaking. So I know that was a lot, but you can see it was terrifying to Ezekiel to see the glory of the Lord. And I can see why frightening these four living creatures and wheels with eyes and flashing of lightning and it was terrifying and but you can see this is what the glory of the Lord looked like when it appeared to a human and this was of course a vision but this was what Ezekiel described it as and we see him describe it as that again later on in the book of Ezekiel chapter 10. Now I'm bringing this up here this later on time because in Ezekiel chapter 10 is the last time that we see the glory of the Lord on earth. For a very long time after this, specifically until the time that we see it in the book of uh, Luke in the, in the New Testament, this is the last time we see the glory of the Lord on the earth. In the book of Ezekiel, chapter 10, we see the same vision that Ezekiel had of the glory of the Lord, terrifying vision, leaving the temple. And it's a, it's, a, it's a terrible thing that happened, but in this time, which is in the 6th century BC, the Israelites had been kicked out of the, the promised land, a consequence of them not following God. And Ezekiel, who's a prophet of the Lord, is already in Babylon. He has 
<clears throat> he has been taken away along with some of the other captive captives because Babylon has taken over Judah and Jerusalem. And the vision that he sees in chapter 10 of Ezekiel, the temple is still standing, but we see the glory of the Lord leaving the temple. It's just a terrible, terrible thing to happen to Israel because God had walked among them. He had chosen them and he had walked among them from the time of the Exodus wilderness wandering. He was their God and they were supposed to be following him, but they reneged on their side of the bargain. They did not follow the Lord and, and God is really just following through on what he told them would happen if they decided to not follow him. He told them very clearly, Deuteronomy 28, as part of the, the laws that were given to Moses, he told them that if they didn't follow him, they would be kicked out of the promised land. And here we see them already kicked out and we see the, the next terrible thing that's going to happen to them. Their temple is going to be destroyed. But before that time, God has already left them, which I cannot think of anything more awful to happen that your God has decided to leave you and not walk among you and not be with you anymore because you have turned your back on him. And this is exactly what happened to the Israelites. And it, it, it is no surprise because God told them this is what was gonna happen. And what we see is in, in 586 BC, after Ezekiel's prophecy, now Ezekiel prophecy from uh, 590-ish to 5, 71. Remember in the BC, it goes from a larger number to a smaller number. So Ezekiel prophesied for 22 years while he was in exile in Babylon. And this prophecy of the temple being flattened, you know, it comes through. Um, in 586 BC, the temple is destroyed. But before that time, this vision comes to Ezekiel and the glory of the Lord had left the temple, had left Israel. Until the time of Luke chapter 2, where we see the glory of the Lord coming back to dwell with his people on the earth. And yes, I'm talking about Jesus, but I'm also talking about this time that I just read to you in Luke chapter 2, where the angels see this glory of the Lord, frightening glory of the Lord, coming back to earth. And it's an amazing thing because again, this is a prophecy that was all through the Old Testament, the prophets, that the Messiah, the Savior of the world, was going to come and dwell amongst men. And here it is, the announcement, with the glory of the Lord coming <laughs> with the announcement back to earth to dwell with man. And the shepherds go to see the actual physical incarnate God on earth in the form of Jesus. And so it's an amazing thing that was that was given to these shepherds. They get to be the first ones to witness the glory of the Lord coming back to earth. It's, it's really, really incredible. And um, unfortunately, <laughs> so sad to say it, but we have the Israelites rejecting Jesus when he came to dwell, dwell among them, as many of you know. And um, he came to save the Israelites first, the, to the Jewish people first. He, he, you see Jesus speaking about that, that, that first to the Jews and then, then you know, to all the people. We, we see that in the announcement that you see in Luke, that, that the Messiah was to come for all the people, but first to the Jewish people. The announcement first to the Jewish people. <clears throat> we have to assume that the shepherds were Jewish. Don't know, but they believed that there was a Messiah and they wanted to go see. So um, first to the Jewish people came the glory of the Lord. First to the Jewish people came came Jesus. Um, he came because he wanted, he wanted them back. He wanted to be their savior. He wanted to <clears throat> be the one to fulfill all the prophecies that they knew in the Old Testament about the Messiah coming. And they re rejected him. They rejected his offer to be their savior, the offer to be the one to wipe away their sin, to be the sacrificial lamb of God on their behalf, which is, you know, you got to think about it. Another reason probably why God picked shepherds. They were the ones that protected the lambs, the sheep, who were going to be the sacrificial lambs on the Passover. That was why they were in the hills around 
Bethlehem. They were they were raising up sheep who were going to be for the sacrifice. That was something that happened every Passover ever since the time of the Exodus. So, yes, of course, you know, there's a, there's a parallel there that God came to the shepherds who were protecting the soon to be sacrificial lambs because they knew that they he knew that they would protect and share the news about his sacrificial lamb Jesus coming where these heads of the heads of the towns the 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 higher ups the heads of the temple the jewish heads of the temple the jewish heads of the town of jerusalem they wouldn't they wouldn't accept they would reject him and that is exactly what they did they rejected him and they didn't share the good news in fact they shared the news that he wasn't the messiah the one that came to save all the people by taking away their sin on the cross so um it's a very, very sad thing to see. And the other sad thing to see is that Jesus tells the Jewish people that their temple was going to be left desolate. Now, it's, stick with me because, as I said, and it is true, the glory of the Lord left the temple back in, in six, uh, six, the 6th century BC when we saw that vision in Ezekiel. And the temple, that temple got flattened, but there was another temple that was built that was called Herod's temple. A much smaller version of the original temple, a much less ornate version, but there was a second temple and that was the temple that was on the earth when Jesus came to the earth. It was the temple that Jesus was um, brought to by his parents. It was, it was the temple that his parents went to, to to celebrate the Passover. There was a temple there. But that temple did not contain the glory of the Lord. And yet, Jesus tells the people of that day, the Israelites, that their temple was going to be left to them desolate. So what is he talking about? What am I talking about? So you can go into, um, let's see here. Oh, I want to find it for sure. Uh, it's in Matthew, and it is chapter, chapter uh, 23. And verse 37, this is after Jesus had come and he had given the seven woes to the scribes and to the Pharisees, um, and he had already done his triumphal entry. So this is towards the end. Uh, Jesus had come into Jerusalem, riding on the back of a donkey. You remember that story? He'd, he'd come to Israel to announce himself as a Messiah. And this is what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 23, 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathered her brood under her wings and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So here you see Jesus is telling them their house is left to them desolate and they will not see him again until they say, blessed is him who comes in the name of the Lord. So when Jesus is saying that their house is left to them desolate, empty, he's talking about him leaving them once again. He is going to leave their presence. It's not talking about the glory of the Lord that had, that had come when he, he, the, when the announcement of him had come, the glory of the Lord didn't come and fill the temple, uh, like Solomon's temple. He went to the temple. <laughs> Jesus himself went often when he was in his time of teaching, he went to the temple. And you see him here coming, triumphal, triumphant entry to the temple. And he's saying to them that he is leaving. He's leaving them, leaving the temple, leaving it to them desolate. He was not going to be there with them anymore after the, the crucifixion. And that is very, very true. And you can see in those verses that he came to them and how often he wanted to gather them, but they were not willing. And this is, this is a really sad fact, but it's something that had to happen. They had to be the ones to reject him and sacrifice him, uh, turn him over as a sacrifice because as part of the whole Levitical system, we needed a high priest, a Jewish high priest to 
do the sacrifice, the sacrifice of an offering in order for sins to be forgiven. So it's all to type as far as the Jewish people go, that the Jewish people had to be the ones to turn over Jesus to say his blood be on our hands because that is exactly what had to happen as far as the Jewish religion went for a sacrifice to be a sacrifice. The high priests of the Jewish religion had to do the sacrifice. So they had to reject him for many reasons, but that is one of them. They had to, they had to give him over and that is exactly what they did and left he left them um, that day, but he still offers the sacrifice to them uh, of his blood, his sacrifice to be the one that takes away their sin and wipes away their sin so that they can be spotless and clean and be with him in heaven forever. He, he still offers that to you, uh, to me, to, to every person who's willing to take it. And um, but unfortunately, in Jesus' time, the Jewish people were not willing to take it, except for some. I mean, all the disciples were Jewish, and uh, Paul was Jewish, and, and I'm Jewish in heritage, and, and there's still a remnant of Jewish people that hear and believe that, Jewish, uh, that Jesus is the Messiah of the world. Um, and so there you have it. Now, I just want to add another thing. I know this is getting long, but in this, it says that Jesus will not come again to the Jewish people until they say, bless is him who comes in the name of the Lord. So until they recognize that he is the Messiah, until they say it, until they proclaim it. And this is something that you see Jesus um, asking people to pray for when he asks them to do to do the um <clears throat> the prayer that so many people are familiar with and this is you can see this in matthew chapter um six the our father is what it's known as and in the our father it says our father in heaven hallowed be your name your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven and it goes on so when the disciples asked Jesus, how do we pray, as part of the prayer that he says to him to pray all the time is, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. That's part of this. He wants the Jewish people to proclaim his name. He is the Messiah. And so as part of the Our Father, it is, hallowed be your name, holy be your name, that those those Jewish people would finally proclaim the name of Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And so that is part of why it's it's there in, in the Our Father. And, and of course, the next part of that is your kingdom come, your will be done, your kingdom come. When Jesus comes again, after the Jewish people finally hallow his name, um, Jesus is going to come and, and the offer still stands. He still there's amazing covenanted promises to the Jewish people. He wants them to be with him forever in heaven. And though right now the Jewish people are still rejecting him pretty much in whole, um, there's still promises to them. And there's still the, the promise that he will come again uh, as conquering king and that he will gather many, many, many of them to himself in the end times when he comes again to bring the kingdom to earth. And just to wrap this up, one last thing. We do see that happening, and we see it in the book of Revelation. And in chapter 4 of Revelation, you can see, again, another picture of the glory of God that John, the apostle John, sees um, in chapter 4. And you see the four living creatures around the throne of God. Once again, that whole frightening vision of the glory of God um, in the end times vision that John has. And so... The glory of the Lord, um, it's a terrifying thing, but it's a magnificent thing. That's what glory means. It means the uh, magnificence, the beauty of the Lord shown all around. And um, though it's a frightening thing, it's beautiful and magnificent. And it's a promise to you. If you come to believe Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you will be with him in heaven Forever, If you repent of your sins, you ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins, the promise is to you. Same thing uh, extended to the Jewish people. Um, 
for this covenant of promise that if you believe in Jesus as your Savior, you will be saved from hell and you will be with him and you will see the glory of the Lord shining all around the throne of God the Father and Jesus in heaven. And you will see that multitude of angels singing, holy, 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 as they, they just are surrounding that a magnificent throne in heaven and and the beauty the glory of the lord shining all around him so anyway i hope that's helpful for you hope that just adds a little bit to this familiar story in luke chapter 2 and that you will come to believe in jesus today as your lord and savior that you will hallow his name and you will become one of his um, beautiful followers and be in heaven with him and with me <laughs> forever um, and with all the other people that have hallowed the name of Jesus as their Lord and Savior um, eternally. All right, hopefully I will see you there and I will see you again next time. It's in Jesus' name. I'm doing it all. Bye now.